Okay, so today we're going to talk about abstract ideas and move on to Hume's theory of space and time. Now, the theory of abstract ideas, or general ideas, occurs uh, in the last section of Book One, Part One. And it's got a lot packed in there. It's actually a, quite an important section. Hume brings quite a lot of principles to bear and he's going to appeal to those later on. So if we seem to be spending rather too much time on Book One, Part One, and this section in particular, it is with good reason. Now, imagine that you're an empiricist, like Locke or Berkeley or Hume, in the sense that you think all our ideas are derived from experience. So our ideas don't have some sort of ethereal intellectual existence that we grasp by pure intellect in the way that Descartes thought some of our ideas came. So, almost inevitably, you're going to lean towards nominalism. That is, you're going to be thinking that all of our ideas must be of particular things rather than abstract essences. So we get Locke saying, all things that exist are only particulars. And he's echoed by Berkeley, and he's echoed by Hume in the section that we're talking about, 1176. Now, if the only things we encounter in experience are particulars, this raises the question of how we are able to think in general terms. How do we get general ideas, or if you like, how do we use general terms? So we're going to start from Locke's theory because Locke's theory provides the background for both Berkeley and Hume. Arguably, they misunderstand Locke. Uh, since we want to understand Hume, we need to understand his misunderstanding of Locke. Okay, so here is Locke on general ideas. Ideas become general by separating from them the circumstances of time and place and any other ideas that may determine them to this or that particular existence. By this way of abstraction, they are made capable of representing more individuals than one, each of which, having in it a conformity to that abstract idea, is, as we call it, of that sort. So the way in which we rank things into sorts is by producing what Locke calls abstract ideas and checking whether things match up against them. Now, he gives an example to clarify this uh, imagine a, a baby, first of all gets acquainted with its mother, its father, its nurse, and as it observes more and more people in the world, it sees they're of a similar shape, they behave rather similarly and so on, it sees the resemblances and forms a general idea of a person, Locke says man. And in forming that idea, they make nothing new but only leave out of the complex idea they had of Peter and James, Mary and Jane, that which is peculiar to each, and retain only what is common to them all. So the general thought is that you start with specific ideas of people, and then you see the resemblance, and you form an idea that retains what's common to them, but leaves out everything that's specific. So you form a general abstract idea. Now, rather notoriously, Locke gave an example uh, which Berkeley made fun of. Uh, it's a little bit unfair in a way because what he's doing in this part of the essay is explaining how difficult it is to form abstract ideas, why it's rather difficult for children to do it. Doesn't it require some pains and skill to form the general idea of a triangle? It must be neither oblique nor rectangle nor equilateral, equicural, in other words, isosceles, nor scalinon, but all of these and none of these at once. In effect, it is something imperfect that cannot exist. Now, if you try to form a general triangle image in your mind that will match up to all the possible triangles you might encounter and not match up with anything that isn't a triangle, 
even if it looks pretty triangular. You've got problems. It's hard to see how you could form any such indeterminate image. So Barclay, accordingly, comes in and says, well, can you form such an idea? Bet you can't. And you can see that he's quoting directly from Locke's essay, saying there is no such possible idea. Locke's whole theory of abstraction uh, is a non-starter because there's no way that we can leave out what is specific to every individual triangle without completely destroying the idea. So how does Berkeley think we manage to think in general terms? Because clearly any empiricist has to give an account of this. He might not say that we have these weird general ideas, but he's got to give some account of how we manage to do general thinking. So here is Berkeley's rival account. A word becomes general by being made the sign not of an abstract general idea, but of several particular ideas, any one of which it indifferently suggests to the mind. And he gives an example of uh, law of motion. And he says, we can think about the motion of an object. When, whenever we think about the motion, we have to think about a specific object. But nevertheless, we are able to use that as an example to think more generally. Now, <clears throat> the clearest ex example of this is probably uh, in geometrical proof, and Berkeley gives such an example. So here we have a diagram that one might use to prove that the angles of a triangle uh, add up to two right angles. So we have the triangle there. Uh, that's a right angled triangle, that's isosceles. Uh, but that doesn't matter, it's just a triangle. We draw a line here that's parallel to the other line. And you can see that this angle is equal to that angle because they're corresponding angles. And this angle is equal to that angle because they're alternate angles between parallel lines. So the angles of the triangle add up to the three angles on a straight line. OK, a very familiar uh, demonstration of a well-known geometrical truth. And what Berkeley wants to say about this is that although when we perform the proof we're using a specific triangle, as it happens, a right-angled isosceles triangle, nevertheless, the proof is equally applicable to any triangle at all. Though the idea I have in view whilst I make the demonstration be, for instance, that of an isosceles rectangular triangle whose sides are of a determinate length, I may nevertheless be certain it extends to all other rectilinear triangles of what sort or bigness soever. And that because neither the right angle nor the equality nor determinate length of the sides are at all concerned in the demonstration. So a very familiar practice of using a particular example as a way of reasoning more generally. Once we've proved that the angles of that triangle add up to 180 degrees or two right angles, we're very happy to extend that conclusion to all other triangles because we see that no part of our reasoning has depended on the specific characteristics of the triangles we've picked. Okay, so that's Berkeley's account of abstraction. We use individual specific ideas with all their particularity, but we use them as representatives. Now, just in passing, um, Berkeley is probably a bit unfair to Locke it's not clear that Locke's theory of abstraction depends on uh, producing indeterminate image, images that will equally match all triangles and none of them. Um, <clears throat> Michael Ayers has argued this uh, at length, but I just give one quotation here, which suggests at any rate that Locke isn't uh, quite um, in the position that Berkeley thinks he is. But at any rate, as I've said, both Berkeley and Hume uh, treat uh, Locke as a foil. They do take him to have uh, this rather naive idea with abstract images. Hume accordingly credits Berkeley with one of the most valuable discoveries that has been made recently in the Republic of Letters. Berkeley's criticism of Locke, his development of an alternative theory of general ideas, um, is a great success. 
And you get the impression from this that Hume's theory is going to be essentially the same as Berkeley's. But actually, it's not quite the same, because Hume gives a major role to custom. Now, we'll see later, when we come to deal with Hume on induction, that custom plays a major role there. Custom is habit. Uh, we see things happen. We expect the same in the future. And here Hume is appealing to a custom which he will later say is very similar uh, in explaining our operation of general thought. So when we found a resemblance among several objects, we apply the same name to all of them. And this name plays a crucial role. Uh, after we've acquired a custom of this kind, the hearing of that name revives the idea of one of these objects and makes the imagination conceive it with all its particular circumstances and proportions. So notice, when we conceive, if I say triangle or dog, the idea of a particular triangle or a particular dog comes into your mind okay, with all its particular features. But as the same word is supposed to have been frequently applied to other individuals, the word not being able to revive the idea of all these individuals only revives that custom which we have acquired by surveying them. They're not really present to the mind, but only in power. We keep ourselves in a readiness to survey any of them. So you think of a specific dog, but because the word dog has been associated by you with lots of other specific animals, those other specific animals, or your idea of them, are, as it were, waiting in the wings, waiting to jump in as needed in your thinking. So all of your thinking uh, involves very specific ideas, but other ideas are potentially there. So... In particular, Hume says, suppose some proposition is put to us which may match with the particular idea we're thinking of at the moment, but doesn't match in general. So suppose I think of the idea of a triangle, and it happens that an equilateral triangle, uh, as it were, appears in my mind. So when I think of a triangle, I'm thinking of a specific equilateral triangle. And then maybe the proposition occurs to me or somebody says to me, all triangles are equilateral. Now you might think that I will be seduced into believing that because I have this idea in my mind which I'm using as a representative of all triangles and it happens to be equilateral. But actually, Hume says, we've got this magical faculty in the soul that when this happens, when some general rule is proposed to us, which doesn't match with all of our ideas that are associated with the word triangle, lo and behold, by magic, as it were, another idea occurs to me and jumps in. The custom brings to my mind an idea of a triangle that is not equilateral. And so I see that the proposed general rule that all triangles are equilateral is false. Okay, so to sum up, some ideas are particular in their nature but general in their representation. So everything that exists is particular, but some ideas manage to become general in their representation by being annexed to a general term, which from a customary conjunction has a relation to many other particular ideas and readily recalls them in the imagination. Uh, Don Garrett has coined a useful term for the set of ideas that are associated with a term and readily recalled in this way. He calls them the revival set. Very appropriate name. Okay. So Hume has his alternative theory, um, but before presenting this, he attacks Locke's theory using some similar considerations to Berkeley, but actually he puts forward three arguments, one of them involving the separability principle, one involving the copy principle that we've already come across, and one involving the conceivability principle that we've already mentioned but not discussed in much detail. So I've put references there. Um, I would suggest, you know, go and look at those passages, see how he argues it. What I'm going to focus on now is 
the first of these, the separability principle, because we'll see that that plays quite a significant role later on in Hume's philosophy. Now, it's a little bit strange when he introduces the separability principle. He says, we have observed that whatever objects are different are distinguishable, and that whatever objects are distinguish, distinguishable are separable by the thought and imagination. We have observed that. When did we observe that? Well, it's not quite clear. He's never said that before. Uh, the nearest seems to be uh, Treatise 1134, where he talks about the liberty of the imagination to transpose and change its ideas. And he refers to that as his second principle, the first principle being the copy principle. So it seems most plausible that when Hume suddenly starts talking about what is universally known as his separability principle, though he doesn't call it that, that he's actually referring back to that principle of the liberty of the imagination. Okay. Now, what exactly does that amount to? Whatever objects are different are distinguishable, and then whatever objects are distinguishable are separable than the thought by the thought and imagination. When we think of different things, we're able to separate the ideas of them. And he goes on to say, these propositions are equally true in the inverse, and that whatever objects are separable are also distinguishable, and that whatever objects are distinguishable are also different. So he seems to be saying that distinguishability, difference, separability, all come to the same thing. Well, his argument for this is very cursory. And this is a little bit strange, because we'll see he does actually make significant use of this principle. He simply says, for how is it possible we can separate what is not distinguishable or distinguish what is not different? And that's pretty much it. He seems to think that it's a pretty obvious principle. Now, I suspect that what's going on here is that Hume is motivated by his general picture of the human mind and his empiricist picture of our ideas as copied from impressions, copied from sensation. And as always, Hume tends to model all this on a visual picture. So although we have five senses and we get ideas from the impressions of all of those five senses, Hume seems most of the time to be thinking in terms of visual impressions and ideas. Okay, so when I look around me, I get a visual image. My ideas are copied from that, and Hume seems to be working with a picture of something like a pixelated computer screen. So I've got that image, we can divide it into lots of parts, and my imagination gives me the freedom to take a part here, imagine it over there. So I can move things around how I like. And it seems to be that if you can separate out a part of that, fine, you can distinguish it, it's different, you can move it around. And this seems to make sense of how um, I've suggested he's referring back to what he called the liberty of the imagination to transpose our ideas. It's as simple as that. But we'll see that Hume immediately goes on to draw quite significant conclusions from this principle, which makes it look as though maybe it's not so trivial. In particular, it is evident at first sight that the precise length of a line is not different nor distinguishable from the line itself, nor the precise degree of any quality from the quality. So, straight away, you think of a line, think of the length of a line, you cannot distinguish those ideas. They're not separable. So you can't think of one of them alone. Now that looks like a much more significant conclusion uh, than Hume's rather um, short justification of the principle would seem to justify. And it raises an obvious problem. Because we do seem to be able to draw these distinctions. I can talk about the length of a line, distinct from the line itself. Maybe I can't form an idea of the line, distinct from the idea of its length, or vice versa. But I seem to be able to talk about it okay and think about it. So 
for example, we can distinguish between the figure and the body figured. We can distinguish between motion and the body moved. Recall Barclay saying that when we think of a body in motion, we always think of the body with its specific motion. And we may use that as a representative when thinking about moving bodies in general, but in our thought, we cannot distinguish an abstract idea of the object that's moving from the specific motion. So again, we've got both Hume and Barclay um, saying that when we think of things, we always think of particular things in all their particularity. So we've got this remaining problem, how we can have general thoughts. So Hume, at the end of section 7, talks about what he calls the distinction of reason, which is so much talked about and so much misunderstood. And he, his account of the distinction of reason, the way we can distinguish between the body and the body moved, is by means of his theory of abstraction or theory of general ideas. It's because of these patterns of resemblance. So suppose we see a globe of white marble. All we get is the impression of a white color disposed in a certain form. So I look at a globe of white marble. What comes to me is a white impression or loads and loads of little white impressions, in fact, disposed in a certain way. So I can think of the globe of white marble, I can think of its whiteness, I can think of its uh, circularity. I'm actually thinking of the same thing. I cannot distinguish or separate those thoughts. However, what I can observe is different resemblances. So when I look at a globe of black marble, I see the similarity in shape. If I look at a cube of white marble, I see the similarity in colour. And it's because of these different patterns of resemblance that I'm able to draw the distinction between the relevant general ideas.